In this video, we're going to take a minute to talk about the history of an atom or our history of how we imagine an atom looks. Um, so our ideas have changed over the years uh, quite a bit. And I love this infographic because it puts it all in one page and shows our progression. So we had, starting with uh, John Dalton in 1803, the idea that we had a solid sphere for an atom. Um, and remember, Dalton gave us um, Dalton's um, atomic theory that we've already talked about um, when we discussed gases. Um, we then kind of moved on to J.J. Thompson's model in uh, about 100 years later um, that we call the plum pudding model. I prefer to think of it as the chocolate chip cookie model, that we have a large positive charge that is then um, has random electrons throughout it, like you would find, I'm assuming plums and pudding or chocolate chips in a cookie. Later on, a nuclear model was developed um, not too long after in 1911 by Ernest Rutherford. Um, and this idea is that there were um, a positively charged particle um, in the middle that was the nucleus. And this work came out of the gold foil experiment and that the electrons were around that nucleus that was at the center of the atom rather than the entire atom making up that positive charge that we saw in the plum pudding model. Building off of Rutherford's work, Niels Bohr presented um, the planetary model of the atom. Um, and this is one that we often use still to describe where electrons might be in an atom. And we still teach it in a lot of classes. And the idea is that we have like Rutherford's atom, a uh, nucleus in the center that's surrounded by electrons. The difference between these two models is that the electrons in the Bohr model have um, discrete orbits um, at distances further and further away from the nucleus that the electron can be in. Um, and this model actually works fantastic for predicting um, atomic spectra of small atoms like hydrogen, but it really falls apart when we look at heavier atoms. Um, and we actually show, can, we see that this model would predict that in heavier atoms, electrons would lose energy and they would actually collapse into the nucleus, um, which is something that we never see. We never see electrons collapse into the nucleus. If an electron is created in the nucleus through a nuclear decay equation, it's immediately ejected. Um, and so that didn't fit with our picture of the entire set of elements that we knew of. After Niels Bohr's work, um, we developed a quantum model of the atom. Um, and a lot of this work came from Schrodinger and many others. And the quantum model of the atom brings us to our modern picture of what the atom actually uh, looks like, or we think it actually looks like. Um, we currently accept it as our most accurate model. Um, and we'll talk about this in detail um, in uh, the current segment of our class. Um, but before we spend a lot of time talking about Schrodinger's model of the quantum atom, I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about Neil Bohr's um, atom first in this uh, lecture video. Bohr's model of the atom evolved out of work looking at the emission spectrum of atomic gases. Um, so an atom or a molecule we found will emit light energy um, after it absorbs some amount of energy. Um, and that light, if you, you pass it through a prism, will actually create a pattern that is unique to that atom or that molecule. And this example, um, an example of this experiment is shown here for hydrogen. So inside this lamp, we've got hydrogen gas. And it's excited and light is emitted from our hydrogen gas. We pass it through a slit so it's in a uh, fine line and then pass that through a prism which diffracts the different wavelengths of light. Um, and so we can see what wavelengths of light make up 
the light emitted from the hydrogen gas. And then if you shine this on photographic film, you'll get the, you'll be able to see the specific wavelengths that um, came from the hydrogen gas that was excited. So the light that was created by that hydrogen gas, it's not the full spectrum, but instead it's going to be discrete wavelengths um, that are observed. And that in and of itself is kind of mind blowing when you compare it to the previous models of the atom, um, which would imply that there would be more continuous light emitted from a sample of an atom. Sorry. Okay. So here's some examples of emission spectrums from different um, atoms. Here we have hydrogen um, and it emits just a few wavelengths of light that we see. One that will appear red, green, blue, and purple. And hydrogen is our simplest atom. Now mercury is a, a quite a bit more complex. We can see that it has more lines um, that represent wavelengths that are emitted by mercury when it creates light after it's been um, had energy inputted into the atom. And neon has even more wavelengths of light that it emits. Um, and, and we all have seen neon signs, and so we should be familiar with the light emitted from that. And these are all the wavelengths that it actually emits. Uh, we can think of these in, in one way. These right here are all emission spectra. Um, another way, this is hydrogen still here. We can look at the entire um, spectrum of visible light and we can show the wavelengths that it absorbs as well right here, which match the ones that it emits. Two ways to think about it. And we could see this, um, and we see this with flame tests too, rather than looking at the light emitted by an excited um, gas of a substance. Here we can actually just use crystals or a solution of something. Um, and so if I made, took a solution of sodium chloride and I had some sodium ions in it, and I put that in a flame, in a Bunsen burner, that would excite, it would input energy into my atoms and it would then emit light. The sodium atoms emit this really intense golden color that's very powerful. And each element is going to have a different color associated with it based on these emission spectra, based on the light that's emitted once you input energy into it. Uh, potassium is this really nice purpley white color. Lithium is bright red. Barium is kind of this whitish yellow. Um, and we've got lots of these. And, and really, this is where fireworks come from. Um, and the different colors that we see in fireworks are from these metal salts that will emit these brilliant colors of light if you input some energy through something like combustion. Uh, here is the spectra of mercury again, and sometimes you'll see these in this way, where again, here's our emission spectrum. And it's trying to highlight the, the wavelengths that are actually um, emitted when it emits light uh, against the background of the full spectrum, or you can see them as emissions in the spectrum of light. So what is not absorbed. So with these observations, um, Ryberg, uh, a scientist around the turn of the century, was able to explain and predict them. Well, maybe not explain. He was able to predict them. He was able to describe uh, the emission spectrum that's observed um, with this equation right here. It involves the inverse uh, square of integers. And integers are just going to be whole numbers. Um, so this is, if we, if we break this out, this one over wavelength, this wavelength right here is referring to the wavelength of light that is emitted. So in our emission spectrum for hydrogen, there were about four of these different wavelengths of light. Uh, R is a constant uh, in the 
the same units that we would have our wavelength in if it was the inverse, so inverse centimeters. And we call this the Ryberg constant. Um, and it's multiplied by one over m squared minus one over n squared. And what these m and n variables are, are integers or whole numbers like one, two, three, four, and, and so on. Um, and, and he could show that you can predict these wavelengths by finding the whole numbers that would predict them using this constant. And so this is this pattern that was observed um, in relation to these emission spectrum. And then Bohr's model of the atom explains this. It, it provides an explanation, some scientific reasoning behind this pattern that's observed by Ryberg. And so what Bohr's idea or Bohr's model of the atom states is that there is uh, quantized energy levels that the electron can occupy. So the electron's position in the atom um, happens at specific distances from the nucleus and not in between, right? And I have like if you were walking up a flight of stairs, you could be at this distance right here from the ground or this distance right here. But if you were walking up the stairs, you couldn't be in between the two. And that's what a, a quantized uh, position for electrons means. It means it can be in one set distance from the nucleus or another, but not in between. And so this was the first model of the atom that accounted for that relationship that Ryberg was able to find. Uh, and, and so it, it shows that uh, the energy of those electrons are quantized and that then explains the atomic line spectrum that are observed. And the idea then is that you have a nucleus in the center of the atom, and then electrons are going to orbit around it like a planet. And like planets in the solar system, they're going to stay in that fixed orbit or an orbit even further away from the nucleus. And so these fixed paths will be at fixed distances. And these distances are the integers. Sorry the integers um, in Ryberg's equation, the relationship he saw between these whole number relationships and the wavelength of light that's emitted. And so it explains then that electrons emit radiation, which is light, when they jump between orbits. So if uh, it's at an orbit higher in energy and it jumps down to an orbit lower in energy closer to the nucleus, the amount of energy between those orbits will correspond with the energy that's released as light by the electron. And that light, this is what we observe in our emission spectra. Here's a picture of that. So within this Bohr model, if I've got my nucleus right here, I would have an energy level of one, two, three, four, five, and so on and so on. And the transitions between these would correspond to, in Ryberg's um, equation, the component of it that's one uh, over m squared minus one over n squared, it would be the, uh, so like here for this one, it would be, uh, M would be the third energy level, so three squared minus, it's dropping down to the second level, one over two squared. This would all be times Ryberg's constant, and that would give us one over the wavelength. That wavelength is the light observed in the emission spectra. And this works really, really well uh, for simple atoms, for hydrogen atoms. Um, and, and that was exciting to have a theory that actually supported this uh, atomic spectra or emission spectra that was otherwise a relationship that couldn't be explained by any other model of the atom. Unfortunately, the model 
only works for small atoms and that it doesn't actually work with heavier atoms. And so as the atom gets heavier and heavier, it, it has this problem that the electrons, if they're orbiting, would lose energy and potentially orbit into and collapse into the actual nucleus where n equals zero. So it, the model isn't perfect, but from it we take a very powerful idea, and that is that um, electrons are quantized in atoms. And this is the foundation of our modern view, or one of the foundations of our modern picture of the atom. And we still use that component of this in the quantum model of, um, of an atom.